All right, let us move on to our next number on the countdown. I'm not going to set this up in any way because I, I just start one where the other one stopped. That's why I'm still wearing the Get Swifty shirt. If you're not getting Swifty, you're you're not my friend. Uh, 150. I really should put the year on this one, but I'm not sure what year it was made in. I just recently got the Blu-ray and I have informed my wife she has to watch it with me. The Quick and the Dead. Do you think Sharon Stone's hot? Neither do I. But in Quick and the Dead and Total Recall, she is. Uh, Quick and the Dead is a great movie. And it's also, it's it's one of those movies that brings Leonardo DiCaprio into focus. Gene Hackman's in it. And it's made by Sam Raimi, who made the Evil Dead movies and the Spider-Man movies. It is a forgotten film. I don't see it very often now. I don't hear people talk about it. And I don't like westerns. I, I really basically don't. There's this one in Tombstone, and I, I think that's it for Westerns for me. Uh, Maverick, too, I guess, but Maverick's not on this chart. Maverick's funny. Um, the Quick and the Dead is is hilarious. Uh, there's the one native guy that, that declares where all the bullets have gone into him, and and one bullet that entered his, his head, I think it was, and it hasn't come out yet, and he just talks about all these places he's been shot, and it's great because it's random. They're just sitting around in a saloon and he just stands up and announces where all the bullets pass through him and where one passed into him and didn't quite come out. And it's it's great. And it, it sets up each shooter in the movie re really, really well. Uh, you have the part where Gene Hackman, who's the evil sheriff, and Gene Hackman being evil is always wonderful, um, where he squares off against this, this uh, hired gun they've brought in. And it ends quickly. It ends really, really quickly. And Gene Hackman lays the smack down. And he is genuinely scary in this movie. And you feel it. You feel for Sharon Stone in this movie. You know, basic instinct, she's running around with a, with a knife. And I, I don't care if she was the killer or she wasn't the killer or she crosses her legs or what she does. But basic instinct is a terrible movie. It's awful. This is not. And the fact that everybody still talks about basic instinct and nobody talks about Sharon Stone and Quick and the Dead is a crime. I saw this in the theater. I watched this with, I want to say I went with Bruce. In the 90s, we went and saw this. I want to say it was the, the mid-90s. trying to think if it was 95. Anyways, uh, we went and saw this in the theater, and, and we loved it. We laughed all the way through. We thought it was great. So I, I don't know what uh, the reason is for Basic Instinct being super popular other than Naked Bits. Because there really wasn't anything else to Basic Instinct. It's an awful movie. And yet, because there's 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 this naked flash of her with her skirt, and I didn't know what they were doing. Didn't you notice there was a light? Anyways, um, regardless, it's a good movie. That being said, let's go ahead and start breaking people's brains again with 149. Black Dynamite at 149. This is another one my wife hasn't seen yet, and it's delicious. Um... I, I don't know how to how to really describe how wonderful this is, other than to say I don't like black exploitation movies. I understand what they are, and it's a fun genre, and I understand why people like it. It's just not for me. Black Dynamite is so fantastic, and so f just it is such a great movie, and and I understand it's black exploitation, and and I shouldn't be as entertained by it as I am. It is so great. When there's those kids and they're they're all like heroin junkies and he just smacks them because he can't handle the fact that these kids are on drugs and he just, ah, I'm out of here. Like, it is so funny. You see a kid looking for a vein. I don't know why I found that so hilarious, but it's genuinely really funny. And then you've got all these weird surreal parts where it's like he's stoned or whatever the hell's going on. It is so amazing and over the top and it never... It, it straddles the line between taking itself seriously enough that you, you buy into the characters, but it doesn't take itself so seriously that it, it takes away from the fun. Um, I, I can't say enough good things about Black Dynamite if you've never seen it and you're wondering what the hell is that doing on his chart. you got to see it. You just have to. It's a requirement. Uh, 148. I don't think Yvonne's watched this one either. Kick-ass. Uh, Chloe Moritz is a little kid. Uh, Nicholas Cage plays her father, so of course he's over the top. Uh, spoiler alert. Um, Kick-Ass, she swears a lot for a little kid. She swears a whole lot. And she gets kicked in the face a lot and shot at quite a bit for being a little kid. 
She's bloodied up pretty good at certain parts of the movie, and it's kind of cringy. So if you haven't seen it, and you look through my list, and you're like, I'm going to watch the movie Shannon talks about I haven't seen. If you're going to cringe at the sight of a little girl getting kicked in the face, this probably isn't for you. Uh, but if you enjoy the idea of a, a hero being risen from just a regular kid, he almost dies. So it's like this kid decides he's a superhero, and he almost dies, which is far more realistic than any superhero movie we've watched, which is part of what I respected about it. And then they made Kick-Ass 2, which just... I need to make a list of the most disappointing sequels ever, and Kick-Ass 2 will be right near the top. It was dumb and dumber, if you know what I'm saying. No, it's just it's just so bad. But Kick-Ass is so good. All right, 147. And I wanted to put this one higher. Because it is a fun little flick, and it it's kind of low budget, and, and it's uh, Steve Buscemi at his funniest. Uh, Fargo, it, it, it lost me for rewatchability. The reason it, it ended up here is just I, I don't know that if I started it right now, I would get to the end. I don't know that I wouldn't find something else to do or, or find myself distracted from it. But Fargo is a movie that if you haven't seen it, you have to see it at least once. Um, it's, it's disturbing in that it's realistic. The way it's portrayed is realistic. Now, the Coen brothers said it was based on a true story, which is caca. Not true. Never happened. But you could just kick that to the side and say whatever, because Hollywood does that a lot. Based on a true story. And the only thing that it, it shares in reality is that there's a guy wearing pants in the movie and that men wear pants in real life. And that's as close to being based on a true story as the movie gets. Um, and Fargo's kind of like that. But uh, there's, there's the... Uh, he's fleeing the crime scene. Or no, he's fleeing the interview. Uh, when William H. Macy's like, I gotta go... Uh, I don't remember what he said. He was going to the washroom or what he said he was doing. But then he just drives off and she's like, he's, he's fleeing the interview. Um... You know, what is it, Margie? Is the crime scene making you sick? Nope, just think I'm going to puke. Like, it's there's there's some nice little fun jokes here uh, in the movie, and it's it's quaint, and, and it's got a sinister side, too. It really showed just how talented the Coen brothers are, and it's almost like they kind of got haunted by how well this movie did and how well-received it was, because then you're kind of fighting to better your own movie. So just imagine you have this perfect moment, and everybody goes, hey... Do that again, but do it better. It's got to be tough. It's got to be very, very tough. Full respect for them. 146. V for Vendetta. Remember, remember the 5th of November. I love this movie. This movie messed with my head the first time I watched it, and at the end of it, I thought it was great. Now, now sadly, uh, the Guy Fox mask has now been uh, overused by the internet. Hey, Anonymous, you guys are pretty cool, and you do some cool things, but, uh, you know, the whole Guy Fox thing, I, I don't know that that's what he meant in Remember, Remember the 5th of November. I'm not sure that what Anonymous does is necessarily in the guise of Fo get Guy Fox and matches up with V for Vendetta. I guess we can debate that in the comment section, but I'd rather not because those those discussions usually turn into ugliness. So let's just say I didn't say it and move on. But V for Vendetta is a very good movie. Um, 145. Yeah, I'm not writing the entire, entire title of this one. Resident Evil Extinction. Uh, this is known as the one in the desert. So if all the Resident Evil movies seem the same to you, it's because they're very similar. Uh, Resident Evil Extinction is the one in the desert. The desert one does what really should have been done at the end. That the world's dried up. Humanity's almost done. This is your last chance. That really should be at the end. And then all of a sudden, three more movies happen when we were supposed to all be dead and water was supposed to be gone. But thankfully, it wasn't that you find out in the next movie. So if you watch this one in a vacuum, it's probably a pretty good movie. Resident Evil, and I mentioned this in, in the earlier video where I talked about Afterlife, they're not supposed to feel like the video games, they're not supposed to be shot like the video games. And Extinction had some fun stuff going on. Uh, I like Carlos in it, um, and uh, Claire Redfield's a lot of fun too. 
Um, this movie did something impossible. It made Ali Larder both entertaining and extremely attractive at the same time. I've never been a huge fan of Ali Larder. For some reason, hers, Claire Redfield, something just clicks. And I'm like, that's a superstar. And I've watched the Final Destination movies and, and seen her. She was in, I think, two of them. And nothing. I just, She's not really, you know, she's just, you know, she's Ali Larder. And she's fine in Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. But something about her in Resident Evil Extinction, something about the way she handles a gun and the way she's dressed, the strut she has, and it just works. She could be a really badass action hero if Hollywood would give her her own movie. She could absolutely pull that off. One forty four is Logan. Brutal violence, some sadness, and a fantastic movie overall. Hugh Jackman is Wolverine. The problem they're going to have going forward is when they make new X Men movies in the Marvel universe, or when they put X Men um, into the Avengers. And now that Fox is owned by uh, Disney, that will happen. So now that now that Disney can put them all together on one screen, uh, we will see the character of Logan, as portrayed brilliantly in this movie by Hugh Jackman. Uh, we will see him portrayed by a new actor. And I don't know how I feel about that, but if you can recast Han Solo, you can recast Logan. And it'll be very interesting to see what they do, because this movie perfectly finishes it. It is one of those movies that it's it's beautiful, it's sad, it's it's very violent, it's very abrupt. Um, and it, it's funny because in the X-Men movies that preceded this, there were a lot of people, myself included, that thought, man, Wolverine wouldn't take this crap. Wolverine's way, way, way too wussy in this. And this is how he's supposed to be. This is why everybody loved the comic book hero. Because he's supposed to be like this. He's supposed to be violent. He's supposed to be an, uh, a mercenary. He's not supposed to be the hero, really. And this kind of brings that home. I think we can all agree. I think we can all agree that Jean-Claude Van Damme is not a great actor. But if you've seen it, I think we can all agree that Time Cop is his best movie. Time Cop's silly, but I love time travel movies. I have a weakness for time travel movies. You're going to see a lot of time travel movies in here. There's a reason I love Doctor Who. There's a reason that I love Rick and Morty. Because they can travel across space, and I assume time is going to be an issue as well. Um, since he can split realities. Because he's Rick, so he can split realities. Um, Jean-Claude Van Damme, in this very silly, over-the-top movie, plays a very silly, over-the-top character, and it works. Uh, Mia Sarah does some very good acting in this, not that it matters, because it's a science fiction movie, it's never going to get nominated for anything by anybody, anywhere, at any time. But, it's a much better movie than it gets credit for. And, there's a nice double cross in the middle of it that you don't see coming. I didn't see it coming, the first time I watched it. Uh, there's a good relationship that Jean-Claude Van Damme's character has with, uh, with his commanding officer in this movie that is really played up well halfway through the movie and even better at the end of it. Um, you know, when he says, yeah, I'm walking on two legs. I've been doing that since I was around the age of two. Is that strange? It's it's a really well-delivered line, and there's some really... It's got a great payoff, and it's a really sweet movie. And I'm really, really glad that it was, it was done as well as it was. Because time travel movies, when they're bad, they're, they're colossally bad. I will yell and scream at bad time travel movies um, because, yeah, Chronicles one that's not on this list. Chronicle I thought was okay, kind of weird, but it, okay. And then it had some some really weird. Anyways, I, yeah, I'm not getting into that, it, but it's not on the list, so I don't really need to get into it. Number 142, Paul Rudd. I love you, man. Rashida Jones is in this, and it, it is a it is a very good movie. Um, comedies, I'm very picky with. I admit, I'm very picky with comedies probably more than any other genre. Um, other than maybe, maybe, uh, maybe war movies. I'm very picky with war movies, too. It's like, okay, so you showed me the, the battle on D-Day at the beach. Anybody can do that. Um... 
you can do it well, you can do it poorly. It's all going to kind of turn out the same because the basic uh, attack and the way things went down, we all know. So since we all agree on the history, you can't really screw that up. But there are some war movies that just trudge along and don't add anything to the story, and there's some that really do, and they're fantastic. Comedy movies, when they're bad, uh, the jokes fall flat, and as soon as the jokes fall flat, I'm out. For me, the jokes in I Love You Man don't fall flat. And I'm not a fan of Rush, and yet in this movie, I laugh my ass off during the Rush concert when they go to it. Um, Because I've done that. I've done that where you bring the woman that you love to a concert and then you kind of ignore her to hang out with your buddy. Because she's not into this music. And you are. You're kind of like, you know what? My buddy's into it. I'm into it. Let's have fun. And the funny thing was I I felt bad for his character in that scene because I'm thinking, you know what? There's nothing wrong with what he's doing here. He went to a concert he likes for a band he likes that he likes more than she does and she wasn't as into it as he is. And his best friend is, so they want to sing the songs together and dance. I get it. I would be the exact same way. So, yeah, I I kind of identified with him a little more in that movie than I probably should have, I I guess. And no, uh, the the lady that I'm currently with is not the one I took to the concert and uh, didn't really pay any attention to because she wasn't into the music. Um, Do I regret it? Not really, because Tesla was awesome. Tesla was great. All right. Uh, 141. And we'll end the countdown here. And if this was the number one movie on my list, there would be people that would be like, you know what, Shannon? You got her. That's a great movie. Return of the King at 141 is the second Lord of the Rings movie that's been on this chart. And it's on this chart at 141 because it's seven and a half hours long. Oh, it's not really that long, but it feels like it. The Lord of the Rings movies are just crazy long. And it's based on one book. And I get it. You know, the books were this wonderful, deep thing. And when they were done, the crew and the director, Peter Jackson, didn't want it to be over. They didn't want this to be how it ended. So why not add on another 20 endings like the book does? The problem is this isn't the book. It's a movie. Um, The actual act of killing and defeating Sauron should have been the end of the movie. That's how movies end. And then, oh, we got to show you all these endings. And I remember in the theater, I'm like, oh, good, it's fading. Oh, it's back. There's another ending. Oh, I'm going to die. Oh, there's another ending. Oh, that's why during Clerks 2, when he talks about the the logical closure point and and the 28 endings that followed or whoever he puts it, I agree. I 100% agree with Randall in that scene. 120% agree with Randall in that scene. There are some fantastic moments in Return of the King, and then there's the stuff they cut out. The voice of Sauron part was cut out of the theatrical release, but they had to leave a bunch of other crap in there. And then the voice of Sauron's in the the extended edition, but it's still not right. It still doesn't feel like it does in the book. So I understood why they cut it out, because they got it wrong. The voice of Sauron is a terrifying moment in the Lord of the King's book, or Lord of the Rings book, and and they they blasted it. It just doesn't work. So that's part of the reason why Return of the King's down where it is. But remember, I still put it above all these other movies, so it's still a pretty darn good movie. It just doesn't get top 50 treatment because it's too long. If they'd cut some time out of it. there's. It almost feels like since these movies and Braveheart and, and some of the Star Wars movies have been longer, that... Now all of the superhero movies have to be two hours or longer or longer. Why? What for? It's ridiculous. Why are why why do you need the movies all movies to be that long now? You know, thirty years ago a movie could be eight an hour and a half, and we could all agree it was a pretty good movie. Now you got to add a bunch of filler in the middle just to pad out the running time, so they go, oh, this is a two and a half hour epic. Why? Braveheart, I understood it. It's it's Scotland being freed from England. It's still not free, but whatever. The movie makes it look like they're free. And, and you know, it's got this good story in William Wallace and Mel Gibson before we knew he was crazy. And that's fine. Return of the King's too long. So there you go. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. And hey, we're up to 141 now. We're getting there. I'll talk to you again soon.